Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wellbeing Wednesday. It is the 2nd of August, almost our anniversary of our first ever Zoom. You are very welcome if you're watching live or a recording. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are concluding last week's um, discussion on teeth and the jaw. And also we've got the delightful Rachel talking about breastfeeding as it's World Breastfeeding Week. <laughs> Try and say that early in the morning. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us and we'll go straight away to beautiful June. Good morning, June. Good morning. Hello, hello. Well, um, I just remembered after we finished up last week that I hadn't done any touch for health. So I thought we really need to include this. Now, this is something <clears throat> that I think other Touch for Health people do, they might. But I realized that there was a, a jaw loosening um, thing from applied kinesiology that I really wasn't happy doing on other people. It involves sticking your finger in people's mouths and loosening the muscle. And I did, nah, didn't want to do that anymore. That was quite some time ago. Um, you know, risk of being bitten for one thing. <laughs> But, uh, but then I, I thought, but you know what? The emotional stress release technique, which is the, the two acupuncture points halfway between your eyebrows and your hairline there, we use that a lot for relaxation, helping our brains get clear, um, calming us down, helping us sleep if we're having trouble sleeping, all those things. And we just hold them very lightly. We can hold them with two hands or with one hand. You can lie down, you can do that. And if you find that you're going to bed, a lot of people, I'd give this to, to everybody who says they think they grind their teeth in the night because it's so good for helping these muscles relax. So basically you can use this for any, any sore point. You can do, use it for a backache, a neck ache, um, a bashed elbow, a bashed knee, a twisted ankle, because it helps to release the blood flow of the area that has got an issue of tension or pain. So by that corollary, you've got tension in your jaw. And if you hold your jaw, so you're in front of the ear with the palm of your hand, okay? So you want to be right, covering as much of the, the upper jaw and the lower jaw as possible and the muscles in between. And you just hold them very lightly. Now, obviously, staying up like this, you're creating a bit more tension in your shoulder. So you might want to do this lying down on your back before you go to bed, or, you know, you can, you can just lean, lean on something. <laughs> Find a comfortable position, whatever's best for you. Okay. And then do one side and then you do the other. Look at you all. You're so good. I know everyone else, I can't see you, but I can see you. You're doing great. So can you feel a sense of warmth in your jaw there from your hand being there? You should feel warmth. You should start to feel things letting go and relaxing. So hopefully that is something that everybody can do anytime you want. You can do it in the day, anytime, um, whenever you think about it. And, and the more you do it, the more the muscles will get the idea that they don't need to be clenching. Because we do, we clench our teeth when, when we hear bad news, when, we, when, we, when we're trying really hard and concentrating, we, we do, we hold a lot of anger in our jaws too actually. But that's a whole other story. Um, so yeah, I think we have a couple of little clips of Dr. Seb Lomas, the, the wonderful holistic dentist from um, Huddersfield. And um, he coincidentally just popped up like things do. When you start talking about something, then you see other things, they just appear. In. And so after last week, I saw his, his little um, Instagram reel about teeth whitening. So it was a very useful thing to, to read, to, to say to be careful with the teeth whitening because what we want to do is remineralize the teeth, not strip anything away because the, the coating on the tooth, but he'll explain it better than I. And then he's got another clip that I just discovered while looking for that one, that about toothbrushing. So that's a really useful one too. He's got plenty. So if you want to search him out, 
on uh, on Instagram. He's the biological dentist, I think. Seb Lomas. So I think we have this little reel coming up any second now. He's he's not the sort of dentist to tell you that breastfeeding is bad for your baby's teeth. <laughs> Some of them do do that. And it's a bit shocking. I mean, I know breast milk is very sweet, but that's not that's not the cause of, of little people's teeth issues. How we do in there with the clips? Not coming. Shall it's we to, to share the clip, June? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Oh, have you got your sound on? Down the bottom left corner. Uh, bottom right, yeah, that one. Sounded for me, but not on the video, June. So okay, let me try. Let me just pro press. Pro let me again. Or well, sixteen percent carbon. Got it. I don't personally believe in teeth whitening the way the conventional is done because you're removing the layer and you're opening up the pores. You should be doing that at the same time as remineralizing. But there's much better products on the market now, which are adding hydroxyapatite into red light, blue light things and adding mineral layers on top of your teeth. Because if you think about the anatomy of your teeth, in the inside layer, you've got dentine, which is mainly yellow. On the outside layer, you've got enamel, which is translucent. You want to be having the translucent layer, the white layer built up, built up, built up, stronger, thicker, so it's more protective, stopping things getting into the yellow layer. At the same time, that actually increases the whiteness of your teeth. So then the toothbrushing one, I think, is is next. So that's interesting that, you know, he he's, I don't know about these red light, blue light things. I have seen some adverts for these things, but um, I don't know anything about them. And I haven't tried, I've got the hydrogen peroxide, but I haven't tried it yet. But you can make the toothpaste with um, bicarbonate soda, again, that's a bit, sometimes a bit too rough. So we, we're giving this advice with the proviso that, you know, you use sensible caution and not overdo it. I think that was the important thing. We have a toothbrushing one coming now. There we go. Start on the chewing first surfaces. I kind of do the whole quadrant at a time. And then you move to the buckle, cheek side. And then I move to the underside, palatal or lingual. He's full of fancy words. This is my favorite toothbrush, bristle. It's the UV and the red light one all at the same time. And right. what more can you want to toothbrush? Wow. There's so much more to learn, isn't there, about toothbrushes. I had no idea that you could get UV light toothbrushes. There we go. That's me done on teeth. We're done. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Maureen, for helping. Thank you, June. Thank you for sharing. Seb, we did a um, Zoom with Seb last year. Do you remember the lovely shell? and brought him over to um, talk to us, PHA. So I will put that link, because I think it's on Rumble, so I'll put that link in the chat when it goes out. So thank you for reminding us. Also, I heard the word dentine that I've not heard for a long, long time. And the last time I heard the word dentine, it referred to a chewing gum. Mm. Yes, that, there was a chewing gum that was called that. I remember that myself. And I'm yeah. not convinced it was good for you. <laughs> 
No, apart from the fact that it exercises your jaws, which yes. is another reason why we have, you know, problems with our teeth because we have not chewed enough. I think we talked about that last time. Yeah, we did. Um, we can chew other things besides gum. <laughs> <laughs> Gar um, Chalfon, who was here last week, he talked about that and the chewing gum that he the non horrible chewing gum um, <laughs> he mentioned is in the description. So it's on our YouTube yeah. channel. If you look at last week's, it's under there. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks for a reminder. And I'm really, really delighted to welcome Rachel, Rachel Huffman. Good morning, Rachel. It's lovely that you could join us live this morning. Good Rachel, morning. Rachel, good morning. Rachel's going to be talking to us um, about breastfeeding. Over yeah. to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Will I be able to share my screen just quickly? I can. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Thanks. I went straight away, but. So hi, and it is National in World Breastfeeding Week this week. So we're going to talk about breastfeeding. It links in really well, and I'll explain in a bit how with what we're talking about, jaws and teeth. Um, but I must admit that when I was asked to speak about breastfeeding this morning, I'm a doula, so I work with breastfeeding mums quite a lot. Um, my heart did go, oh my goodness, because it is such an emotive topic. So I'm going to give a little uh, disclaimer to that before we start. So um, I didn't realise before I was a mum, like how, how emotive we get over what we feed our babies. And we really do. And it comes up with a lot of guilt and a lot of emotions um, around how we feed our babies. So firstly, I'm going to do a really gentle, informative talk about breast milk and not the who's and the why's um but just yeah I was sitting uh feeding my baby when he was about two months old my first baby I had a book with me can you imagine how easy it is when you, when you can sit in a cafe and read a book and um I had all my coat stuffed under my arm and I was feeding him and I didn't think that anyone could see but I was sitting by a window that was sort of a different color so I thought you can't see in the window I can see out the window you can't see in and I began to sort of become aware that there was a group gathering <laughs> looking in the window of mums with buggies and I thought oh my goodness what's going on and I didn't really think they were looking at me until they all walked in and said excuse me are you breastfeeding your baby and I was like oh, yes <laughs> and they went oh well done that's an amazing thing to do and I was like <laughs> the shock because obviously I thought I was minding my own business and I was really embarrassed by the it being drawn attention to I was quite pleased that it was a positive thing but so far in my experience it hadn't been so my son uh, is 19 in a couple of days um so it's a long time ago and people were not really on board with the whole breastfeeding um I was reading a little bit into the history of this uh, yesterday try and get myself up to date and it really wasn't encouraged back in the sort of the 50s from the 50s onwards um mums were told that their breast milk was too thin generally and that it wasn't going to feed the baby so because of that um it became the norm to use formula feeding and also to use certain times of day to feed the baby so when those mums then came to feed sort of my age um they just automatically reached for a bottle because that was the standard and breastfeeding sort of became a bit misunderstood. So um, so my experience really was quite negative of people saying, so when are you going to move on to a bottle? So when you, so um, yeah, so that's kind of how it comes about as a very emotive topic and I don't want to step on any toes or upset anybody. Um, and you know, we, we all do the best we can for our baby. So I'm just going to give a little talk about what's in breast milk um, and how it all starts. So I will share my screen quickly. If I, yeah. So can you see something that says the arrival? Brilliant. I'm going to try and make it bigger, but I can be a bit technically challenged. <laughs> Do a full screen. No, it doesn't want to. Okay, if you can see that, 
basically it's saying if mum and baby are healthy immediately so we're going back to immediately after baby's born baby can be put straight to mum's chest and it should doesn't need to be wiped there's no need to wipe baby the only thing that needs to be over baby is a towel or a, a blanket um so that mum and baby can really get to know each other um so the pros of this is it sets up the skin to skin sets up the baby's microbiome so a few things need to happen when the baby's born because obviously when the baby's in the womb it hasn't had to digest any food it's been working with its digestive system with the amniotic fluid but it doesn't digest in the same way that it will when it comes out so immediately we're setting up to the mum's microbiome to help the baby learn how to digest so then the next thing that happens is if we put an undisturbed baby and by undisturbed I mean really unwatched and untimed um, um, without needing any any procedures or anything done and we just leave mum and baby in a dim light what will happen is the baby will naturally begin to crawl up the mum's tummy and chest and start looking for the breast so because babies see contrast and they see circles so boobs are brilliant for that so when they start to do this um their their little feet sort of push against the uterus and that begins to detach the placenta naturally. So the placenta starts to come away. Um, the mum, mum's hormones begin to realise that baby's been born. Um, and then the baby begins to sniff and lick at mum looking for some food. So the sniffing and the licking stimulates more contractions, which then helps the placenta to be expelled. So mum's all ready to get rid of the placenta. And when she when the baby begins to actually try and suckle that stimulates a bigger contraction so then allowing the placenta to be born so all of that um, physiological stage if that's allowed to happen is a brilliant setup for your first feed um, also what happens as well in a sort of managed birth which is all births um, there's an expectation there that baby will immediately latch on and feed so there can be quite a lot of pressure on mum but actually that doesn't always happen that way. It can take up to an hour for baby to actually work out what is milk and how to latch because it's not the most straightforward. It seems like it should be, but it's not as a, the most straightforward and obvious action for baby. So, um, so this happens over an hour. Babies also are very tired when they've just been born. So there'll be quite a lot of resting. If this period is undisturbed, what you would notice is that the baby has a little rest and then it's picks its head up, starts bobbing around looking for milk again, and it has a little rest. So this is the ideal beginning for your breastfeeding journey. And um, the first milk that you make will be a thick yellow milk. So people don't always realise um, when we're told to express ready for baby, um, and sometimes this is a good thing, sometimes not, but when we're told to express, there's very, very little coming out. And that is because the first milk is in a different substance. It's very thick, it's yellow, um, and baby's only getting about a teaspoonful of this substance because what that does is it's gonna coat the intestines with the um, microbiome again to help baby digest the milk that is to come. So all of this is set up to help with, with baby's digestion and also this lasts forever. So this setup of, of baby's digestion is going to affect the way that it's able to digest. But don't worry if that hasn't happened because it can be corrected later in life, but this is the ideal setup um, for your baby's digestion. So uh, where do we go from here? Um, the golden out. So nobody makes the same milk. So everybody's gonna make different milk each baby is going to have different needs. And the next thing that we usually do once the placenta has been born and we can reach baby and pick it up is we give it a kiss. So when we kiss our babies, um, what we're actually doing is we're sampling for any bacteria on the baby. So when we sample the baby with our mouth, our bodies get to work straight away making antibodies to anything that they think might be dangerous to our baby. So straight away, we're going to start making a milk that's specific to anything that baby's been exposed to. 
which is really cool. And um, you would notice this if you were actually to express milk at certain times. And I know people have done this, especially during COVID as well. Like if people had COVID going around or they had it, they express their milk and they notice it actually comes out a slightly different color because when, when the milk's exposed to different bacteria, it may start to change color. And what you can do is, you can actually freeze that milk if you want to, so that if your baby becomes ill with that illness, you now have your own personal antibodies created for that illness. However, you could just feed as it comes, but sometimes we have an oversupply or the baby's not hungry because it's ill or whatever, you can freeze that milk and then use it for up to three months, defrost and feed your baby the milk that's specific to whatever you had at the time. So that's that's a really good thing to be able to do. Um, so what is in our milk? So our milk, I'm not gonna go too far into this, you could go on all day, but basically it's made up of fats, which is gonna, which I'm gonna tell you more about in our little demo in a minute. Um, we've got full milk and hind milk. So when we feed, when we, when we, we drink milk, it's all sort of together and we're not realizing that how it separates. Okay, so it makes two, so it falls to the bottom, the oil comes to the top, the fats come to the top, and we have a drink. But when babies are breastfeeding, they get firstly the full milk, so they're getting a drink, and then they get their food. So it comes out differently. Um, uh, so they get their fats, they've got DHA, um, ARA, omega-3s, and other fats as well in there. Um, they also have enzymes which don't fare too well in formula because they because of the heating process, they're not going to work as well. Um, so inside of the breast milk, because it's live, we have enzymes that help digest the fat as well. So that when your baby poos, it's basically just only getting rid of the least that it can. It's using as much as it can out of that milk. Um, it also uh, proteins. So we've got the whey and the casein, um, just like any other milk, uh, but human milk is more uh, whey. Whereas uh, other animals like cow's milk is going to be more casein proteins. Um, and I think that might be, and my science isn't amazing here, but I think that might be because your cows obviously have to grow really big, really fast. Whereas we're, um, our levels of casein and whey are set up for us to grow in our levels. So, uh, yeah, and then we have the vitamins, minerals, iron as well. So, all of our everything that we need in there. Um, and we can also eat in a way that helps us to provide the best for the baby, but the baby will take from us rather than, uh, so it would be us that's depleted rather than the baby. The baby will get everything that it needs. Um, and obviously the milk that we provide um, changes as the baby grows. So um, I'm feeding my three-year-old at the moment and that milk is gonna be very different than what he would have received as a newborn because his nutrient needs are different. And obviously, if he's exposed to anything, um, the, the milk will adapt for that to keep him healthy. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna show you a little bit, if it works, I'm gonna turn my screen. I see if you can see three, you should be able to see three types. Yes, okay, cool. So what I'm gonna show you is how the milk works. Oh, hang on. Am I still sharing my screen? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Right, can you see the flaps? Your sound has disappeared, Rachel, because you've oh. turned away from the microphone. Oh, no. Okay. Right. Yeah. Let me try and stick myself in here. Can you hear yeah, me now? Yeah, get yourself in. That's it. Yeah. Get myself in. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some, and you can do this as well. If you have a, um, a mum call up in distress and say, what is going on with my baby's feeding? It's doing some odd things. You can explain how the, the feeding works like this. So I'm going to put a little bit of oil into my water. Can you see that? Okay. Can you see the water? Water in with oil in. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So that is our breast milk. And what happens when the baby's feeds? So I'm talking about the full milk and the hind milk here. 
So we can imagine like a dungeon. But this is the beginning of our food. So the first thing that's going to happen is loads and loads of watery corn out is coming out. So this is what you can see. Lots of water in there, just a little bit of crack in there. Sorry, Rachel, can't hear you, hun. So I'll turn around then. Yeah. And I can say, so you've got the idea here. There's quite a lot of water has come out immediately out of the sponge. Yeah. So what the baby is doing here, they've just latched. They're starting to suck. And what's coming is this really watery milk. That's like your starter, for example. So they're having, and they have a drink before they get their appetite up. So if we do what's recommended, which is the 10 minutes on each side, what we might end up happening is that all we're getting is this great watery milk and they're starting to feel full. Go to the other side, get more watery milk from that side because they haven't begun to reach the next, the fattier milk. So to get the fattier milk, they're going to have to start working a bit harder, which is when we talked about the jaw, um, when we breastfeed, it's a very different latch to a bottle. There are better bottles now that are wider and you have to latch differently. But what they're doing essentially is working quite hard with their jaw continuously to get a bit more of this fatty. I don't know how well you can see this. Get a bit more of this fatty, fattier um, hind milk. So they're working quite hard. And then at this point, they might come off, they might burp, they might just need a little break, they might fall asleep. And this is where if you tickle their feet and you feel like they haven't quite finished, they're gonna come back and have a little bit more. So the last bit yeah, is basically, this is like dessert. So they're gonna have to work really, really hard. I don't know what you can see coming off here, but there's a little tiny bit of this fattier, substance coming off of the sponge here you can show anybody this with their own dish sponge and it just gives them a really good visual of how hard the baby's going to have to work to get that last bit of fatty hind milk and that's like dessert but what that's doing is that's filling the baby up so the baby's starting to feel full and when we don't feed for long enough on each side obviously like I said, they're just filling up on the full milk, but they're not actually receiving the fattier milk. So you can have a baby that feeds an awful lot, but maybe doesn't put weight on as much as you'd expect. And that could be one of your issues. So as I said, that the way that you're feeding there is involving the jaw. And I don't know, I think June knows better than I do, but certainly I've read that the way that your jaw moves and when it's moving that much in infancy it actually can affect your bite as you get older. So it can affect the space that you have in your mouth for your teeth. And this is where, you know, you can feed your baby to term. I know that the World Health um, says up to two years is not like, what's the word? The recommendation is to feed your baby for up to two years. But that's an average and that's up to. So that means that some babies obviously do feed longer than that. In England, the rates are really low. I think it's something like 2% are fed up to six months. So it's quite, yeah, it's quite a low rate. I don't quote me on that, but it is somewhere around that. Um, so it's very, very low. And obviously that means that other places in the world, babies are, must be fed for quite a lot longer. So it it is a normal thing and people will wean at the age that is appropriate for their lifestyle it's all good so um i think that's all i had for today um over to you thanks oh thank you so much rachel that was fantastic i was, I was just wondering if you would mind um the little demonstration you did are you able to just record that separately so we can share that because i think that's really useful information for people I can do. I actually learned that from Maddie McMahon. You might want to write her name down. She is a an amazing doula. She's a doula mentor and she's a bre uh, breastfeeding counsellor as well. Um, she taught that to us when we did our doula training and she said, oh, go ahead and share it, spread the word and tell everybody. So um, I can 
uh, provide a link and she actually goes into more of the details of what's in the milk as well as she pours bits in she does a really great visual for that so I'll pop, I'll pop that in later oh. on and you can share that on brilliant it's also the tongue isn't it it's 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 not just the it's the tongue and the movement of the the fascia and the, at the base of the the mouth which then links up with all the other fascia in the body so it's it's getting the cranial bones moving because I know this from my relations my friends and, and colleagues with 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 various different disciplines over the years um the osteopaths say that it must it helps with the cranial to pop back after this after the head's been squeezed through the birth canal it helps the the cranial bones pop back to their natural position and it helps does. them move yes and you actually notice that so when you're looking to see whether um, a baby's latched correctly, you're looking at the the jaw and the ears to move up and down when they're when they're actually milking, so that yeah. you can yeah, so that you can make sure that everything's moving. And it does. You will actually be able to observe like quickly how the baby, especially if they're cone shaped, that as they're feeding, the shape of their head will actually change. But yes, you're right, and we did have to go, even though that my son was born and was undisturbed and he had breast milk, he still needed to go and see a cranial osteopath. Um, and sometimes what can happen is where they've molded and their head is like a cone shape and they're born quickly, sometimes things just go back really quickly and don't give the head time to adjust. So I think on that sense, it's really important that all new mums go and visit a cranial osteopath just to kind of reduce yeah. the stresses and tensions from the birth for mum and baby. And going and visiting a cranial osteopath or a craniosacral therapist can affect the breastfeeding journey because when the baby is able to move their head and their jaw in a more efficient way, they're going to feed better, they're going to have less wind, um, and be less fussy, less colicky. So, um, yeah, doing that straight away, I absolutely recommend. <laughs> so, yeah, unbelievable! It's amazing. I, when you were talking about just one side and then the other, and I must have my my um, health visitor must have been um, a very wise lady. But I remember her telling me to write down, to, you know, what the last breast I'd done. So <laughs> it was left the last time and then it was going to be the right that, yes that's the thing. how on earth do you remember <laughs> yeah some people I put a nap nappy pin on my bra oh. <laughs> that's what I was told put a nappy pin on the on the side that you had it yeah Robin's nodding yeah same same school <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes I would put a hairband but then I'd get confused because I'd be like did I put it on the one I just fed from or <laughs> have I got to put it on the one I'm supposed to feed from next so I'd get confused but I think the main point is uh you know not to stop too soon so even if you go back to the same breast like some people can only feed off of one breast it's the way that it goes and and some babies will prefer it and that could be because of the way they're born or the way they're lying in the womb that they've got um a preferred head position which means that they might prefer feeding on one side and that is that can happen so it doesn't matter if you only feed from one side what matters is that they actually complete the feed and it's okay if they don't if they fall asleep go back to that side again to make sure that they've actually worked to get the hind milk out and then they're going to feel much more full. Excellent, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that information. I think it's going to really help a lot of people. And thank you for joining us. It's great to see you live. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, amazing. And now let's go. I'm doing it already, Robin. I'm bringing the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> um, straight over to Robin this morning. Thank you, Robin. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you for that, Rachel. That was absolutely fascinating. Fantastic, valuable information. I love that demonstration with the sponge. It just makes it so simple and easy to understand, doesn't it? Okay. Right. So let's just find our feet, first of all. Feet facing forward as much as possible. If they do come out to the sides, make sure your knees go in the same direction if you're going to do any knee bending. There's not a lot, but slight knee bending. Keeping the knees soft, keeping all the joints soft in the body. We don't stretch out to 100% in these practices. If you have got any conditions, any discomfort, pain anywhere in the joints or in the body, just please bring that into consideration when you're doing the movements. It's very gentle, but 
and maybe like raising the arms up might um, just cause some discomfort for some people if you've got any conditions. So let's just arrive into ourselves. Let all that lovely information, let it just be absorbed and just let it run through the body, allowing the mind to just fall still, connecting the mind with the body, because this is what these practices are about as well. Mind and body connection. And breathe. Just allowing the sensations to gently fall down through the body to the feet. Just opening the toes, lifting the toes up gently and planting them back down. Lifting the heels, planting them back down. Feeling the insides and the outsides of the feet. And then that little point underneath the balls of the feet, the bubbling spring, the kidney one point getting a sense of connecting to that lovely energy from the earth. Grounding, sinking, connecting, sending your energetic roots down, just like a big strong oak tree. Feeling a sense of balance, support and safety. So important to feel them qualities. Make sure the weight's evenly distributed on each side as much as possible. And then just allowing that energy to seep up through the roots, through the feet, through the legs, through the channels in the body. And just getting a sense of every time you breathe in, you're breathing in more of that lovely energy. Every time you breathe out, you're softening into your body. Softening areas that might feel a bit tense, a bit stiff. Getting that sense of connection to yourself, to your body. And just noticing how you're feeling as well. Acknowledging how you're feeling. And then letting that energy come up through the spine, down through the shoulders, the arms to the fingertips and just wiggle your fingertips a little bit. Acknowledging your fingers. And then just allowing that energy to come up through to the crown of the head and getting a sense of connection to the sky. Now I've put a bright yellow top on this morning because it's been pretty grey here <laughs> for the last few days. And I just wanted to brighten myself up. And let's just imagine that we're connecting to that beautiful radiant sun from the crown of the head. Remember that the sun is there. We might not always see it. It's always there. And there's a saying, if you can't see the sunshine, let's create our own sunshine. So let's do that now. And just imagine a beautiful radiant sun above the head. And cascading down beautiful, nourishing sunbeams. Lovely energy, light energy, soothing, softening, replenishing, nourishing, easing away any tension that might be in the scalp, the forehead, the facial muscles, the jaw, going down through the front of the body, the back of the body, the left and right sides of the body and down through the center. So just imagine we're fully immersing in these sunbeams. And I like to imagine these sunbeams smiling. 
So, and it, when I imagine the sun being smiling, I smile. You bring that smile, that inner smile to your body, to your mind, to your spirit. And it can help to just lift the mood because the weather can affect our mood, of course. And some people it affects quite badly. So the more that we can create our own sunshine, the more we can light ourselves up, fill ourselves up with a radiant sun. Imagine absorbing that nourishing vitamin D into the bones, warming the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments. And then imagine the light going into the heart. And again, imagine like a beautiful sun at the heart center. Smiling. <laughs> And just let that smiling, sunny energy go to all the other organs in the body, nourishing all the other organs, lighting them up. And imagine all your organs now smiling. Smile at all your organs. Imagine them smiling back to you because you're looking after them, you're giving them some attention. And then come back to your heart energy. The heart is associated to summer in Chinese medicine, the fire energy, the yang energy, but it's all about balancing. So we haven't got excess of an energy, just balancing them energies out. Doing something that brings you joy, laughter, lightening the heart energy, a good comedy, a good belly laugh. And let that light shine out. Imagine that sunlight shining out to everybody. Everybody on this session now and going out further. Connecting to other people. Your friends, neighbors, family people in the town, then going out further. In the country, across the seas, to animals, all living beings. Imagine the light from your heart connecting with everything in the world, in the universe. And then bring it back to yourself, always bring it back to yourself to, to replenish yourself, fill your own cup, the more you can fill your cup up with light, with nourishment, good food, good company. The more we can support ourselves, nourish ourselves, replenish ourselves, the more light we can absorb, the more light, love, blessings we can give out to others. So fill yourself up first. And this is just one practice you can do. There's lots of other practices. Bring it back to your heart. And then just bring in your hands to your heart. And we're just going to open up from the heart, bringing the hands forward. And then stretching out to the sides, pushing out, just turn your head to one side, don't let your arms go above the shoulders, sending that heart energy down to the hands and just gently turning the head to have a little stretch out there. And then let's gather that energy, bring it back to our own heart. So we're gonna breathe in and open, turn your head to the opposite side, push through, sending that energy and blocking the meridians. Looking at your little pinky finger, your little finger to the heart, the heart meridian goes to the inside of the uh, small finger. And then let's breathe in, bring it back to our heart. And then let's have a little shake out. Let's get some movement going now. So shaking can release tension. It can also release excess chi. We don't want too much chi, of course, because it can cause 
what we call tree deviations. They can get blocked. So it's about, again, balance. And if you feel like you've got a lot of energy, like agitation, frustration, anger, you might just want to uh, discharge that energy. Have a little shake out, just go for a walk, a brisk walk. Breathing in out, have some cleansing breaths. Let's do that now. Breathing in through the nose and then make the heart sound. The, ah. the sound is so healing, as we know. Releasing stagnation through the tissues, shake out through the feet. And again, let's breathe in. Um, sometimes I think, what, what, what do the neighbours think when I'm making these noises? And that just makes me laugh. So again, laughter, best medicine. Right, let's rub the hands together now. As Kerry said, let's uh, stimulate the energy. Energy moving, get the hands warm, and then just bringing your hands to the sides of the body. Notice how the hands feel. You might feel tingly, warm, cool. And then with your feet about shoulder width apart, just like I said before, just softening the knees, the knees, tailbone down, coming up from the crown of the head, opening the shoulders. And then we're going to do a movement from Tai Chi Qigong Shibashi Set 2, which is a really good movement to do by itself because it activates all the channels in the body, it gets the, the blood and the chi flowing, the fluids. And it also activates the three dantians, the lower dantian, middle dantian, upper dantian, three energy centers. So just softening the fingers, fingers pointing down. We do a breath in through the nose. It's a very gentle breath in and a very gentle breath out through the mouth. I know we, all the rest of the time, it's, it's advised to nose breathe. Um, but this one, we don't want it to be too tonifying. We want it to be harmonizing. So we're not dispersing too much chi, but we're not building up too much chi in the body as well. It's a harmonizing breath. So we're going to breathe in gently through the nose whilst at the same time just raising the arm, the arms. Don't lift the shoulders up, just let the shoulders drop down. Imagine your shoulder blades dropping down at the back. And then we're pushing the palms out to the sides and gently bending the knees as we go down, if that's comfortable for your knees. Then we rise up again, breathing in gently. Now we want to imagine that you're pushing the clouds away above the head and allowing that light to cascade down as we breathe out. Now this helps, this is a beginning form, so it helps to regulate the breath with the movement. Because when you combine the movement with the breath, that's when you're doing Qigong. Synchronizing the breath, movement and posture all together, that's Qigong cultivating the chi and circulating the chi. Breathing in gently, breathe out gently, pushing out into the way chi, your energy field, and then down. If you find that your knees are collapsing in, just imagine that you've got a ball there, a nice soft ball, just pushing the knees away gently, putting the the weight on the outer edges of the feet if you do find that your knees are collapsing inwards. It, it's quite um, common for the knees to collapse inwards, but we don't want to make a kink in the chin. So I'm pushing out, I'll do one more of these, breathing in, absorbing that lovely energy all the way through the channels to the tips of the fingers, the crown of the head, and then breathing out. Allowing the arms to just fall to the sides of the body. And then we're gonna honor the moon. We've just had the full moon. We're still in the energy of the full moon. 
So we're just going to turn to the side whilst at the same time, imagine that you're gathering the full moon, come back to the centre and then bringing that moon energy down through the body. Again, just softening the, the knees as you go down. You're holding the moon just underneath the navel, so you're filling your lower down up. And then we turn to the opposite side, gather up the moon. This is another movement from set two, Shibashi. Gathering the moon and sinking the moon through the body, filling up through the channels. And then turn to the side again, gathering the moon. Turn to center. Bring that moon energy down, calming, cooling. So this is like the yin uh, energy. We've got the yin energy of the moon, the calming, cooling energy. And we've just done the sun, of course. Now, this movement as well is very good for hot flushes. It helps to balance the hormones, helps to reduce uh, heat. So it's a good one to do if you do have anything like that, or you're just feeling hot. Imagine the beautiful, calming, cooling energy of the moon. Coming down, filling up the lower dantian, and then turning to the side again, gathering. And with the twisting actions as well, twisting from the waist and the hips, we've got the, we're strengthening the kidneys as well. A little twist, a little squeezing of the kidneys. So turn, gather, breathing in gently as you come up. Breathe out very gently as you go down, absorbing that beautiful energy of the moon. Just do one more on each side. Last one, breathing in. Turn to the centre, breathe out. And then just letting the hands go down, releasing any excess chi through the feet into the earth. Gently bring your feet together. One last movement, raising the arms. Let's honour the moon and the sun, bringing in the yin and yang, gathering both together. Breathe out as you come down through the centre, back to your heart, and just give yourselves a bow. Thank you for joining and have a beautiful day, a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> Thank you. Give yourselves a clap. Thank you, Robin. You are a ray of sunshine. Thank you. <laughs> Always. <laughs> I know everyone really loves uh, what you do, and thank you again for joining us this morning. And we conclude today's amazing session with Maureen. Good morning, Maureen. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And oh, another fascinating day. Thank you so much, June, because you triggered a memory um, when you were talking about finger going into the mouth and relaxing. Um, and I'm continuing on with teeth because it reminded me of a time when I went to the dentist and I would go from being an ordinary in control human being to a, a completely out of control nervous wreck and this particular dentist he wasn't very nice um, but had nothing to do with it I was so so nervous and he had his finger and he said bite down so I didn't bit his finger but I just bit down more but he instructed me to and in my <laughs> I just bit down more so it reminded me of that so um so yeah <laughs> which ties into what I want to talk about going to the dentist. So an awful lot of people are absolutely petrified, hate it with a passion. I've had lots of clients over the years where we've had to work with that emotional system so they can just go into a calm place because it can be severe trauma for people, absolute abject trauma. And it can't be healthy for the dentist either because they put themselves at risk when they're putting their fingers in people's mouths. and Often when I've worked with clients, one of the things that has linked back to dentistry, maybe in childhood, is when you lay there, you have no control and you feel completely helpless. And 
often because your mouth is all stretched. You can't even speak. You can make a noise, but you can't even be heard. Um, and you're so fearful of everything. It might be fearful of the injections. I used to be petrified of the injections as well as everything else. And what happens with us, we, we develop, whatever we experience, we develop a pattern of having those in our system ready to be triggered. And what's useful for us to, to, to know is that we may have that inside of us. And if that's the case, it's good to get it out so that we're feeling in control, feeling a sense of balance and calm, because when we're in that state of mind, we are our most resourceful as well. So a lot of people in this day and age, for lots of different reasons, without them knowing under that surface may have a control. I'm not in control. I'm not in control. And it might be something as simple as I'm at the, the, the till at the supermarket and because they've pulled a face because I'm paying cash, I drop all my money and, and I can just so naught to 100 miles an hour can go into that feeling of not in control. So we want to recognize and have that good self-awareness as well being Wednesdays, what we're always talking about. Let's look at that self-awareness, because once we're aware, instead of letting it become a wild horse that's harder to pull back, we can actually manage it early on and it's much easier to do that so what I want you to think about as well um again triggered by what, what one of the ladies was talking about fear um on let's let's in our mind unwanted fear is not good for us have a think about that for a moment think about the fears that you might experience that you don't want I've I've just had two kittens um that I'm looking after fostering for the cat rescue and they went for their neutering yesterday. And I have so many fears around looking after them, especially as they want to be climbing and jumping and doing everything. And I don't want to put them back in a box and put them in a, a hood and a body, body suit and everything. So I've got, I had lots of fears without me even noticing. And then all of a sudden I remembered, ha ha, I'm actually fearful. And that fear made me more jittery in managing them. So I lost a, a little bit of my resourcefulness. And one of the things that we can do is a little bit of tapping. So we're just going to very briefly do a little bit of tapping. Now, where you are today, you're in control of one thing that is highly important, yourself. So beautifully, we are in control of ourselves. Other people, other situations might be happening out there, but what we can do is control how we respond to it. So a just nice little EFT couple of rounds, just getting our minds into that mind frame. And we tap down here at the, what we call the karate chop point where the little finger is. So you can just repeat after me, even though things may be going on that I can't control, but I can control me and I totally accept. There may be things that I can't control, but I can control me. And I love and approve of me anyway. Even though life is what it is and there may be things I can't control, but I can choose how I want to respond to that. And I might not know right now how I want to respond to this stuff. I totally accept it is my choice how I respond and I'm in charge of me. I'm not sure how I want to respond. They do what they do, life is what it is. How do I want to respond? All the ways I might respond that's not healthy for me all the ways I might respond that's not good for me, all the ways I might respond that I might regret later, or later I can think I could have done it better, all the ways I respond, I choose to respond. And it's safe for me to let go of old ways. So take a deep breath in and just have a think. In certain situations where you might not feel that you have control, it could be simply, simply if somebody's talking over you or they shut the motorway 
or there's a, a sign on the door or somebody comes and tries to tell you that you've got to do X, Y, and Z, whatever it might be, just have a think. That's still going to go ahead. How do you normally respond? It might be that I get angry, I get frustrated, my mind goes blank, I feel really uncomfortable, I go hot, I go shaking, my legs, my legs shake and, and feel all hot and horrible. Think about what that is and just ask yourself, would you like to let that go? So I want you to just imagine whatever that is that's negative, that would be lovely to go. And if you miss it, so if you miss feeling sick and having bricks in your stomach and your legs shaking and your mind going crazy and then maybe you come out with all the wrong. If you miss that, you can always go back to it. But you'll probably find that having a sense of peace and joy is much nicer and you have choice. So just I want you to just put it into a box and give it a colour. So it's a solid coloured box. So you can't see what's in it, but your mind knows what it's in it. So let's call it my response box. And mine is red. So you can just tap on the mind is very clever on how it works and what it does. So you can just go with, even though I have this red response box, when that happens, I totally accept that I have this red response box and I love and approve of me anyway even though I have this red response box, I totally accept I have this red response box. <laughs> Hard to say, I wish I'd have chosen a blue one. <laughs> this red response box. And it's safe for me to let that go now. And I am safe. And I love and approve of me, whatever happens. My red response box. This red response box. All the ways I'm holding on to this red response box. It's safe for it to go now. I'm safe. I'm in control of me. It's safe to let the red response box go. I'm safe. I choose my responses. I'm open to changing so that I have the best responses for me and my results. And take a deep breath in. And just breathe out. And then just connect with that, that box. What's it doing? And it's whatever your mind's metaphor system will tell you. Forget it being, it's not real, it's in my imagination. Your unconscious mind works brilliantly and it can work brilliantly reprogramming your response system. So mine has actually gone, it's gone smaller and for some reason the edges have softened and, and have gone a bit round. Um, luckily, I can't, rem I can't think of how you, it's still, I'm still going to call it a box, but it's a rounded box instead. And it's gone to orange. So just work with whatever your mind is giving you. So even though it's now an orange rounded box, I love and approve of me. Even though for some reason I'm hanging on to this orange rounded box and I love and approve of me. I wonder how I would be if I let go of this box completely. So I choose in the moment my best response and I feel calm relaxed and resourceful I don't know and I totally accept that I for some reason I'm hanging on to this orange rounded box and I love and approve of me whether I hang on to it or whether I let it go this orange rounded box my orange rounded box all the ways I'm holding on to this rounded box all the ways I may think I need this orange rounded box. Maybe it's safe to let it go now, or maybe it's safe to let it go later. I'm happy that it will go when the time is right and I can explore this new way of responding in a safe and beautiful way because I am in charge of me, my mind and my responses. So take a deep breath in. And just breathe out and just capture what's going on for you. So it's quite simple, even just five minutes first thing in the morning, because you never know. As I say, I've got these kittens. This has been a real experience that has been tugging at my heart, my stomach, my everything. <laughs> and I've put it all in a box because there's just too much. To, if I was to write a list, there'd be just too much. But instead, my mind knows everything connected to that. It's clever like that, everything connected to that. So 
allow yourself to know you are in charge of you, your responses, capture that awareness. What is it I'm feeling? Is it good for me? Yes or no. Is it wanted? Yes or no. Is it helpful to the results I'm getting today, in the moment, whenever? Yes or no. And if it's unwanted, put it in the box and tap it away. It's amazing what we can do with our mind. So thank you so much and have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you, Maureen. How is everybody feeling? That was amazing. Brilliant, thank you. And yes, we are in charge of us, aren't we, ourselves? How are we going to respond today? Good question. Let's report back how our day went. <laughs> thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you, June. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Maureen, for another fabulous session. Thank you for joining us today, this morning. And if you're watching the record, thank you for finding it. On behalf of the People's Health Alliance, thank you for joining us for Wellbeing Wednesday. And we hope to see you next week. Goodbye. Have a wonderful day.